Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak at uh, this conference organized by the Arab Monetary Fund and uh, the BIS. I would have loved to be with you uh, in physical presence, but uh, today, on the, the 7th uh, uh, of uh, December, we have a Eurogroup in Brussels. In fact, uh, after the speech, I am immediately going there and uh, we will have discussions in the Eurogroup and in the ECOFIN tomorrow to hopefully agree on the new framework for the Stability and Growth Pact. We call that the Economic Governance Review and that would be the new rules that would govern the monetary union and our fiscal policies from there on. So it is an extremely important uh, meeting which obviously I had to attend. Um, let me uh, tell you that uh, I'm very glad to be participating uh, to this uh, conference, especially with uh, the um, Arab Monetary Fund, as it is uh, our peer in the region. Uh, they are part, like we are, of the regional uh, financial arrangement programs that we have. We meet on a regular basis with you, the Arab Monetary Fund, and also with the IMF and the other partners around the world. And this dialogue is important because we compare notes, we are faced with similar issues in global finance, and it's good to know how we want to prepare for the present crisis, the known crisis, the unknown crisis that uh, are always going to happen. We are living in a period of polycrisis, uh, since the pandemic and now the geopolitical and geostrategic conflicts uh, in the planet who make ensuring uh, financial stability more difficult. I'm going to divide my presentation in three parts. I'm going to explain in the first part the role uh, of uh, the European stability mechanism, uh, which I have the pleasure uh, to lead since one year. In the second part, I'm going to explain what uh, uh, has happened uh, in bank supervision uh, in uh, Europe uh, over the last years and the state of play uh, today. And then in the third part, I'm going to look a little bit into the future, the challenges uh, that are in front of us. The ESM uh, and its uh, uh, predecessor, which was a transitional uh, uh, setup, the EFSF uh, were created uh, 2010 for the EFSF and 2012 for the European Stability Mechanism. And this happened uh, when we had the sovereign debt crisis. And at that moment, we realized in the euro area that we did not have a lender of last resort. It was a failure to anticipate that. It was a gap in the system. Also because once we started the common currency, we thought that uh, we would never be facing risks of fragmentation as they then happened. As a result of uh, this uh, uh, setting up of the ESM uh, and EFSF before, uh, we supported financially five countries, uh, Ireland, Spain, Portugal, Greece and Cyprus. Uh, and the total amount of loans that were issued uh, by the ESM and the EFSF to support those countries was to the tune of 300 billion euros. Uh, these 300 billion euros are being uh, refinanced on a regular basis and the ESM is present on the market uh, every year. This year we uh, issued 28 billion euros of loans, uh, the same probably next year. Now, uh, the uh, ESM has a few tools uh, to help uh, support uh, banks uh, that are uh, facing difficulties. One uh, is uh, a direct uh, recapitalization instrument and uh, the second one is an indirect uh, recapitalization uh, of banks. And the indirect tool was used once in the case of Spain where uh, we uh, issued loans to uh, support the Spanish government would then, who would then support 
uh, with that uh, uh, financial help uh, the Spanish banks and uh, the amount that was then mobilized was 41 billion euro in the period 2012-2013. The uh, direct recapitalization instrument on the other hand was never used uh, up to now. But we have also a third instrument that's coming into play uh, uh, very soon and this is the backstop that the European stability mechanism will ensure for the single resolution fund. Now the single resolution fund uh, was established a couple of years ago and collects contributions from the banks themselves and in fact uh, the capitalization of the single resolution fund will be finished uh, by the end of this year uh, with an amount that we will be close to 80 billion euro and the uh, European stability mechanism will then uh, serve as a s additional safety net, as an additional backstop and uh, uh, it has been decided uh, by the member countries uh, of the ESM that uh, we would commit up to 68 billion uh, euro to strengthen uh, the financial position uh, of uh, the single resolution fund. We would issue a credit line in case the funds that uh, the single resolution fund has would not be sufficient. This helps obviously reassure markets in, in case of uh, failures of uh, banks and also limits the risk of, uh, the risk of contagion. Sorry. Uh, the ESM is operationally ready to uh, have that uh, functioning uh, and has an agreement with the single resolution fund to uh, be uh, operating as quickly as possible and obviously this will happen when the new treaty of the ESM will have been ratified. Let me now come to the second part uh, of my presentation which is how uh, is the banking supervision and bank resolution handled uh, in the European Union. Exactly at the same time when the ESM was born, uh, which was in the aftermath uh, uh, of the uh, international financial crisis and the sovereign debt uh, crisis, uh, Europe decided to uh, set up the banking union. In the first uh, pillar, the, what was decided was to set up the single supervision mechanism. This has uh, enabled to harmonize uh, the supervisory uh, practices of uh, uh, banks uh, and, and specifically for, for the systemic banks uh, uh, in Europe, uh, the number of which is around 110 today. Uh, this uh, resolution of failing banks within the banking union also came under a central European authority, the single resolution fund I just uh, mentioned before. The idea is obviously to uh, protect taxpayers' money. If they are, there are bank resolutions as a consequence of bank failures, it will not be the taxpayer who will pay for or who will foot the bill, but the banks themselves. Let me also underline that if the uh, ESM were to uh, operate the credit line, uh, that money would be reimbursed also by the banks. Now, these two major measures, the single supervision mechanism on the one hand and the single resolution fund, have made our banks stronger. And uh, if we look at the tier one uh, common equity uh, of the banks uh, in the uh, banking union, they now reach the level of 14%, which is roughly double the amount of uh, what uh, was the case uh, in the international financial crisis. Um, another very reassuring element is that uh, the banks have now far higher liquidity buffers than they had before. So these are, this is good news and uh, this will help face uh, uh, losses uh, in the future if there are such losses, uh, the expected ones and even the unexpected ones. 
Um, <clears throat> a stress test are done on a regular basis. The European Bank Authority just did such a stress test uh, quite recently and uh, the stress test showed, as I mentioned also the numbers a minute ago, that our banks are more robust and resilient than uh, before. Now, you could say stress test is always very theoretical. Now, unfortunately, we had the banking turmoil in then, uh, um, banking turmoil involving um, the collapse of several US banks uh, this year and also uh, the failure uh, or the taking over of Credit Suisse. And there was obviously some fear that these uh, financial turbulences could impact uh, European uh, banks, but this did not happen. So this was a kind of life-size test that uh, the European banking community survived quite well. Let me now come to the third and last part of my quick uh, overview of the, the challenges that uh, we are facing uh, today. The turmoil, my first uh, point would be that uh, the turmoil that happened this year has uh, showed that uh, we should not only focus on the risks that come with the largest uh, banks because uh, the troubled banks in the US were, you could say, medium-sized uh, banks. And nevertheless, there was a risk and there is a risk that that could spill over to uh, other uh, banks and that you could have a domino uh, effect. Thus, the line separating the too big to fail banks from institutions that are not systemic uh, is uh, being much less clear than we thought. So the picture is a little bit more complex and uh, we need to take that into account. Even institutions that are initially regarded as smaller or less significant uh, can be interconnected with larger ones. So it's a kind of domino effect that we, and that's what we learned in, in this year's crisis and we have to take that into consideration. The second uh, thing that is uh, also uh, an observation of what happened this year is that effective coordination and communication in a crisis is extremely uh, important. Uh, um, effective coordination between various authorities such as central banks, regulatory bodies and government agencies is necessary to implement timely and cohesive measures in order also to avoid spillovers across borders. Now we know communication between authorities at the national and international levels is crucial for coordinated responses and preventing the spread of contagion. Now, keeping that in mind, what are the challenges uh, and the necessary responses? And let's face it, we cannot be complacent and think that because we have made a lot of progress that the situation is 100% under control. So, we live in an increasingly uncertain uh, world where countries are being confronted with many challenges. I would like to mention three. First is the climate risks. We know that they are there to stay and that uh, extreme climate disasters, demographic changes and the, uh, that, that go uh, with these climate uh, risks are, uh, are going to have an impact also financially and we've seen that in front of our eyes in the last couple of years. The second uh, risk that we see, uh, also very evident uh, this year, is uh, uh, the speed at which a crisis can spread because of uh, internet and because of digitalization. In terms of bank runs, we were used to observe that over weeks and months in the past, today it can happen in the matter of hours. And the third challenge or third risk that I would like to highlight is the geopolitical conflicts that we are witnessing all around the world and uh, in particular close 
uh, to uh, the euro area in uh, Ukraine with the war uh, of Russia. And uh, this is not the only uh, geopolitical conflict. There are many more around the world. And is this risk was obviously the one that was in number one position at uh, the IMF meeting in Marrakesh. All these uncertainties uh, obviously uh, create an atmosphere of deglobalization, uh, which obviously uh, is um, loosening or weakening the financial stability worldwide. We at the ESM are uh, doing our, um, we are learning our lessons from the past and we are doing our homework. We have uh, started a review of our lending uh, instruments in order to make sure that we are well equipped and fit for purpose. At the level of uh, the banking union, we are looking into how to better uh, protect us in cases of resolution of banks. I have mentioned before that we have uh, in place a single supervision mechanism for systemically important uh, banks, but we think that uh, we also need eventually to look into a medium-sized bank, and that is why the European Commission has proposed the crisis management and deposit uh, insurance uh, uh, directive, which is uh, under discussion uh, right now. And uh, we as ESM support uh, this uh, initiative and hope that uh, it will be possible to have concrete results as soon as possible. But all the more prudent you are, uh, all the more you try to anticipate, we, let's face it, there are future crises ahead that are unknown. That, that is why we must continue to make sure that our banks have sufficient buffers, both in terms of capital and in terms of liquidity. So that's where we stand today in Europe. I thank you for the attention. I'm now rushing to Brussels for the Eurogroup and the ECOFIN, and you'll probably read about that in the media in the days to come. I wish you a good conference.